Uh, all right, hello. Uh, welcome to KCP Community Meeting, November 2nd, 2021. Um, the, there's a ton on the agenda that I think we'll all get to, but um, I wanted to propose in this, uh, in this meeting, moving this meeting an hour earlier to be more EU friendly. Um, there was, I, I think I could even do earlier in the day, but I think that starts to get hard for uh, Pacific US folks. Um, would an hour earlier on Tuesdays work for people? I'm seeing light head nodding, thumbs ups, and no screaming. So it passes with uh, with unanimous or you know something like it uh, approval. Uh, all right, I'll move this uh, an hour earlier, and we'll see if that works. And if it doesn't, we'll move it again, and we'll figure it out. But um, yeah, great. Uh, oh, that should be fun. Also, next week is also time zone shenanigans so it'll be perfect uh, no one will have any idea when the move when the, when the meeting is um there have been a lot of discussions in the uh in the slack and in various documents and i wanted to sort of tie them all uh, or bring them all to here to make sure that we all had visibility on all of them i think uh there's a lot of good discussions and we probably will continue to have discussions before next week uh but uh one of them, I think, it, well, sorry, uh, I'll just go in order that they are listed here. Um, how we handle workspaces is an open question, or I think could be an open question. Uh, how we handle auth, uh, both authentication and authorization for uh, the KCP layer and at the physical cluster layer is something that people have brought up as a potential cause of concern. And um, Stefan and Steve, who I don't, no, if Steve is here, Steve is not yet here uh, or is not here. So um, maybe we'll table that until he gets back. But um, uh, there was a discussion about uh, the resource version, the opaque resource version that we had talked about, uh, I think last week, um, carrying information about which shards we want, uh, uh, which shards need to be asked for data. Um, the way that that is currently being prototyped might have a hard limit of something of the number of shards we're allowed to have, or I mean the shards not allowed, the number of shards we can possibly describe in that uh, in that information. And uh, that limit is lower than the stated goal of being able to run a thousand shards. So either that means we need to relax that limitation or understand that limitation better or come up with a different way of ex expressing that information than when we have the one and what we have been prototyping so that we can get to those thousand shards. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if any of these are things people want to talk about first, otherwise I will dig into workspaces first, but if, if there's anybody um, or anything else that uh, that is not included in this list, because I know there's been a lot of topics in a lot of areas floating around. All right, um, so the workspaces thing, is um right so one thing we want to be able to do is say create me a workspace and install these services in it install these apis run these controllers or register this workspace as caring about these apis so that some external controller can watch them a multi-cluster controller can watch them um this is relatively easy to do if we don't have uh uh on-demand logical clusters. The reason uh, the reason this is difficult, the only reason this is difficult really is because logical clusters you know, come into existence the first time something is put in them. Um, and so if it was an explicit request to create a workspace, then something could watch for those things and uh, assign some policy and say, oh, you're a workspace that cares about these APIs, I will install those APIs or, or register you for these APIs or whatever. Um, since logical clusters come into existence on demand, which I think is a good design. I, I don't think we should undo that. Um, either something needs to watch for those things to come into existence and make them into workspaces, or workspaces are a concept outside of logical clusters, which so, I think is what we had been talking about before. Stephane, where is, where is this? I just want to make sure that we get this to fun. Yeah, where is this coming from? Like, I'm missing the context, Jason. Sure. So, like, so go back in and say, like, what are we trying to accomplish by asking this question? Uh, that's what I was missing. Right. Um, uh, Gorkum specifically uh, wanted to be able to have workspaces come pre-installed with some things 
to, to say like, this is a, uh, a workspace that should have, um, you know, Tekton installed on it or, or Argo CD or some, you know, name your, name your add on. Um, and in that case, I mean, it doesn't pre-installed doesn't mean like literally comes into existence with those things, but, uh, upon creation gets these things installed into them. And there's a few different ways we can implement that. There's a few different, uh, mechanisms we can do to watch for those and install those things. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of picking which one we like the best. Um, Stefan, I want to make sure we get to your hello. Yeah, basically a similar question. I mean, define what a logical cluster is. This is one thing. Maybe I'm not the only one who has all, not all the details in, in the head. And so, um, when you, and maybe, maybe do that first then. Well, so okay. we should we should be pretty clear. Are we asking what we want or what it is now? What, what's the what, what are we what are we trying to get to? Because like uh, we have a pretty extensive doc that lays out a lot of these. It's just not organized particularly well. I think we've. I, I feel like maybe we're at a point where maybe we shouldn't have to ask this question, or the fact that we're having to ask this question or, or do it means we don't have good enough like summarization of like a key concept that we could say like this is a proposed concept here's the counter arguments and the justifications versus having to do it here. I think that's because I'm kind of surprised that Gorkin would ask that, or we didn't feel like we had a pat answer, which just may mean that we're not encoding enough information in like a, 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 a decision point or like it's there, but it's not understandable or someone can't be like, oh, this is where we define what logical cluster is and this is what workspace is. Like that's kind of what I'm sensing a bit of. Is that fair or unfair? I think I think that's a, a reasonable read. Like, if this is something you think is a settled debate, then uh, then if people are asking questions, it's because they don't know that the debate is settled, and or or, or are challenging the the settled you know right. answer that we have come to. But we can't in accelerate case. the process of getting to a is this settled? What are the open questions? And then how do we move past it? Uh, and where would we go to record that? Mm -hmm. So like. Uh, this one, I felt that we were in a pretty good spot on, but it probably isn't. So I expected the grouping concepts ADR uh, doc to lay enough of this out, but arguably it's probably not in that doc right now. It's probably in the one that's shared with the community, the, the broad one, the sharding list indexing, and probably should get moved there and someone should take a stab at it. And I'm happy to take a stab at the sections that I put in the other doc and move it there unless someone else would like to be that person doing it um, like to the sake of argument and then say hey does this explain it enough that we can argue about it I'm happy to go through and make an attempt at that because um, I know I have a lot of questions about the terminology and I think like you you've seen in my little private doc trying to get some of this stuff explained in, in my own words so if I can lift that and put it into a public facing doc, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, because I, I felt like we were kind of in the breadth section and then we were trying to boil it down as more people were getting involved. And so then there's like, this is a great opportunity to say like, this should be something we should be able to either definitively answer or say what the remaining questions are. And then Gorkum's question would then be effectively a test of, does that explain it enough that he agrees or disagrees or can he does he have a place he can register that oh i thought of another use case is that captured in the spot where someone else would then see that someone asks a question does this design encounter that so i mean this is mostly yeah. just a failure i think of the docs um, yeah it, it it definitely might be right like like uh if we know the answer but we cannot communicate the answer or know the terms but cannot describe those terms clearly, then, then you know, uh, it's like having no answer. Um, uh, I'll let I'll let Andy go. I did talk to Corkum yesterday, and I think his concern or question was largely around isolating the implementation of workspaces from the changes that we'll be proposing for Kubernetes to support logical clusters. Um, I think the questions around how do I know when a new workspace is instantiated as a thing is 
a concern for implementing workspaces, but I don't think I, I may be characterizing it incorrectly, but I don't think Gorecom's concern was specifically around like how do I know that a new workspace is there? Yeah. And I would say like, so just to summarize what I thought we were all on the same page with, a logical cluster is a bunch of low level details that allow a generic API server to virtualize one key space into many. A workspace is a concrete implementation of that, that comes with a set of trade-offs designed to solve use cases. So logical clusters don't say anything about what APIs, logical clusters don't say what APIs live in them. That's a that's an implementation detail. Workspaces so, um, would- David uh, used the wording, I think, logical cluster is just another string next to the namespace and name of objects. Is this the same understanding? I, I would say a logical cluster is how you would split the, it is the mechanism whereby the cube API pattern is split into the storage engine. In, it's the prefix, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah key yeah. prefixing, I think, is accurate. But maybe like we would just say, like it's adding another tuple to how an object is stored in the storage engine. It's, it's not a resource. That's what I mean. I mean Correct. A logical cluster is, an, is like uh, the registry storage in cube. It does not, it might be useful in implementing a higher level concept. It is not a concept in and of itself. Um, and then workspaces are a use case driven API type that bind or set of APIs that bind the necessary concepts to accomplish the use cases for workspaces. Logical clusters don't, logical cluster is a tool used by that maybe is plugged into to satisfy the workspace. So a workspace is probably a combination of capacity, quota, APIs with a life cycle and a lifetime. Logical clusters don't have lifetime, workspaces would. And so then the question would be, if that's wrong, we would go back and say like, oh, well, we, we have a question about life cycle. Well, that's a workspace problem. What are the things that you would need to solve a life cycle problem for workspaces? That may be a logical cluster mechanism. So I have a few clarifying questions that I think I already know the answer to, uh, but it will be instructive to me if my per perceived answers are incorrect. Um, a logical cluster is a, a low level implementation detail. Users never actually care about them. They are mainly a prefix in a key in storage. A user creates a workspace and deals only with that workspace, correct? That workspace maps one-to-one -to, -one to a logical cluster, but they don't know, they don't care. They say, give me a workspace. Uh, to your point, Clayton, they, they define in that workspace some quotas, some APIs, some things about that workspace, but that's what they care about. They don't care about the logical cluster. Logical clusters are implementation, are on our side, implementation. There exists an API that allows someone to request a workspace. Once they have requested and satisfied, there are a set of use cases and requirements around what that API has to accomplish. Right. Then at the end, they get a the ability to access that workspace like a cluster. Right. That that would be like a cube client can make cube calls inside that workspace context, which is the overlap might be uh, maybe there's concepts in cube or you know the client go changes as Steve's talking about whatever is necessary for a client to target that. Um, ideally, it should be opaque to users mm -hmm. to be a good interface. And I think the opacity of that interface. The next question, this Andy sounds like what you were kind of bringing up was, is the interface for creating a workspace cube like? Or is it a completely just arbitrary, has no thing? What are the use cases that constrain works, that workspace interface such that we would ask the next question, which is, are there cross workspace operations that allow you to deal in bulk with applications that span clusters? Is that a requirement for us to solve in this initial phase? Maybe not, but we haven't explored that. So that would be one of those open questions, which would be, is there any scenario where I'm going, like today in Cube, you can apply two namespaces and then create two deployments in those two namespaces. Is there an equivalent use case for, I want to apply two workspaces and then 
apply that? And the answer is because of the decision that a cluster is the fundamental concrete scope that we're not trying to like redefine what clusters are and we're not requiring clients to change everything. The answer right now is no, you cannot do those operations. And so the opacity of the workspace does not require that a single cube control apply, allow you to create a cluster and then immediately put resources into it. You would have to target that client um, after an apply. So that's like current the current state as far as I know. And Andy, like, did the, anything there not match kind of what your gut was based on what you've heard from docs and other discussions or it just I, didn't seem I, like it was that clear? I think it lines up. Um, as I've expressed a couple of times in Slack uh, today, I think the terminology problem is something that is hindering me um like i i'm struggling with logical cluster workspace virtual workspace org workspace etc cetera, etc cetera. and so part of what you were suggesting earlier about trying to have a rallying doc around definitions and uh, concepts i think would be really helpful um i know david had previously proposed or questioned if logical cluster was the right term. I don't want a bike shed in this meeting, but I will add my vote to suggesting that we come up with a different name for the, the API tenant boundary within etcd for all this. Yeah. Certainly the naming of implementation details needs to be clear to the people communicating it. But if we have that separation, it's a small set of people that have to argue about that name. And it has to make sense to the people maintaining that code for sure. Uh, Stefan. You know, the question I, I wrote in, in the chat already. If logical clusters are, are not a resource, nothing concrete, just a string. So uh, today, so the analogy I draw today is a Kubernetes cluster has a very strong namespace concept that is not in any way something that the storage is aware of. That is use case driven, it evolved. We took an approach that had trade-offs where we implemented namespace lifecycle via admission control and via controllers. Um, the design of the lifecycle of workspace is different than the design of like namespace is not a special resource, right? Like there's nothing inside of writing to a deployment uh, other than the fact that the code for implementing deployment knows that it's namespace scoped that changes how it interacts with storage. Um, however, deleting a namespace has guarantees because of the other design choices we made, like supporting the idea that a namespace is not physically homogenous in an etcd or is not physically co-located in an etcd like you can have aggregated apis that requires us to support the idea of a controller that instead of saying hey delete this namespace and all the stuff in it has to talk to each resource enumerate the resource delete all of them wait for all of them to act um, i do not think we have a enumerated the use cases around life cycle of workspaces sufficiently to make a choice about an implementation of whether the physical cluster or whether the storage engine is aware of the life cycle of logical clusters. We have not enumerated the use cases we're actually trying to solve sufficiently to make that design trade off. Um, so but we're we getting there. About garbage collection, finalizer, controller, those things, they must be aware in some way. And I think all of them are relevant. Um, we're not trying to, we, we're, we, we need to make the determination of are there specific benefits that we would be going for based on the use cases we have, which arguably in a single cluster, deleting a whole single cluster is never a problem we solve. It is absolutely a problem that we have to solve inside of a logical cluster, right? Like deleting a logical cluster has to work. It may need finalizers. It will need to communicate. We will learn from namespaces. The difference is, I think, um, that we may be demanding a slightly different uh, access pattern, use case, consistency guarantee. We also have some watch everything in a name, watch everything in a workspace use cases that arguably Cube does not have, except for garbage collection controller, which it doesn't actually watch everything because it's possible to go say, well, I don't want you to watch this. And then we have virtual resources and aggregated APIs, and it doesn't watch, we never. We dealt with the implications of those. We never really came back around to it. So 
arguably the storage implementation needs to depend on the use cases from life cycle of workspace and specifying what the life cycle of workspace is effectively what Berkman is asking. Like, can we clarify the interface expectations, life cycle? What are the trade-offs? Um, what do we have to go research based on like garbage collection within a workspace? Do we allow cross cluster garbage collection? Probably not. What are, what are there, what are, what constraints can we place on the problem? Uh, work through those. So. I, I would probably say that was what I was trying to prevent was us going too far down defining those so that the folks here have the opportunity to be like, here's a meaningful trade off, here's the requirement, um, or here's a here's a meaningful requirement we believe is achievable. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I just forgot the question I was going to ask. Uh, nope, it's gone. Uh, if anybody has anything else, they want to talk about workspaces. I think we'll probably keep talking about workspaces uh, here and elsewhere anyway. But, but uh, Andy's putting the hat on for this, right? Andy, I, I saw you assume the hat for terminology, yeah. better clarification of the existing art for workspaces and the enumeration of the remaining questions or the, the open design questions. Um, like we just right now brought up a couple of them, um, but you'll own that going forward. Yes. Regarding terminology, if if the term logical cluster is confusing and is a low level detail and should not be something users or clients care about anyway, can we just call it an etcd key prefix? Like if that's what it is, if that's what we are calling it, like that that sounds sufficiently uh, inter implementationy and scary that hopefully people will stop thinking of it and thinking of those as cluster like if we just call them the lowest possible level thing they are. Yeah, you, we could call it like, a, I think like that's an example, storage shard identifier, storage unit, like um, yeah, storage tenancy unit or something like that. Like those are all options. Because uh, while they're called something like cluster, people will think of them as things they can put things into. And that's what actually we want workspaces to be. Workspaces are the are the thing users care about. And again, workspace is kind of an opinionated approach, whereas logical cluster was intended to be presented as a capability that uh, different users could find value in. And I think you could say different technology, anybody who's capable of forking a minimal cube API server and adding in Go interfaces is going to want, you know, clear concepts. Um, we'd want to make sure that there's other use cases besides workspace to at least but if they're none, workspace was intended to be a little bit more opinionated than we like cluster and namespace are opinionated, right? We made specific trade-offs with namespace to accomplish a set of use cases. Mm -hmm. YOLO'd it. Seven years in, we've learned things about what namespaces are good and not good for. We've dealt with the implications. Um, we don't want to yeah. throw out the so I think it's totally reasonable. Okay. I also remembered what my other question was, which was just to be clear, workspaces are part of KCP, but will not be part of what we propose upstreaming into Kubernetes. Kubernetes the argument would be a clusters. workspace. Yeah, a workspace couples API types, API definition, uh, tenancy, and uh, a um, the pattern for how you access lots of these little clusters. It is probably a KCP projectism with mechanisms in cube. Now, it may be that we actually do want to propose it for cube. I think we're pretty far from that until you can show a working valid system. And we do not need workspaces in cube for cube to be successful or for KCP to be successful or for minimal API servers to be successful, I do not think. Yeah, yeah. Workspaces also, I think, are only useful in multi-cluster scenario, multi multi-logical cluster, although that term is bad. Like in the multi-user use case that Kubernetes upstream doesn't need to focus on, doesn't doesn't have to have an answer for. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we're in. His, yeah, historically, all of these storage related approaches to subdividing a single cube cluster lacked generality, which would be like, you could come up with a way to subset certain classes of resources or API objects or namespaces or whatever, none of those have enough heft that they have a clear value over all the trade-offs, right? Like you could, 
we, we talked about various approaches in API machinery a couple of years ago about like uh, breaking the tenancy model up so that you could have stuff that only a core set of controllers sees. None of them had enough generality to be useful. So I'd say it's a, it's not a goal right now to, to make workspace a cube concept. It is okay. a goal for us to clarify the semantics of all cube clients such that a workspace works for all cube clients or something like that. Okay. Make sure that, yeah. Um, that might be a useful segue to, to talk about stuff that Steve and Steph Stefan have been um, going over about changes to client go or changes to um, list watch in general to list watch across shards uh is there any this is a big ask is there any like tldr of the last week's worth of thinking on uh uh where we think we're going with uh with complex resource versions and client go potential client go changes i saw some stuff in the slack that frankly scared me a little bit about changing the interfaces yeah so I think unless we come up with a different mechanism for handling requests when uh, logical clusters move between KCP shards, we need complex resource version even for clients that are talking just within one logical cluster. But that doesn't require any changes client side. The client side changes would be required for uh, if you imagine a controller that's KCP aware and knows that it is going to be talking to multiple logical clusters, the informer that drives its work queue is doing a cross cluster list and watch. It just needs some mechanism by which to say, I would like to delete this thing from this particular cluster. Uh, and that, that does require some changes somewhere in the interface. Okay, so those those uh, I think this is miss information I was missing before. The uh, changes you were proposing to add the cluster to the uh, API client is specifically for KCP multi-cluster aware, multi, yeah, multi workspace aware. Yeah, things. we had the, the the naming controller of the CLDs today as an example. Or the, uh, Andy had found a problem, like it had to list all other CIDs, and for this request, you have to know which cluster, cluster you target. So you get an event from the informer, which has somehow encoded the cluster, the cluster string, and you have to direct your client to the right one. So this right. is always needed in non-trivial cases. If you don't want multiple clients, which is also not what we want. So this is needed even if you are only talking to one cluster, to, to, to one shard, to one workspace exactly. in one cluster, one shard, you still yeah. need to have that uh, on the API. So for the, because it's a etcd key prefix and because we currently have a way to pass that through like opaquely, if you know that you're always operating within one logical cluster, nothing needs to change client side. Like, the resource versions that you're going to have on the objects that you get back are complex and not comparable, but nothing behaviorally changes and nothing has to change in the code. The client then the, their only responsibility is to accept that resource version, do nothing, don't look at it, hand it back mm -hmm. and, and everything always, still works. Stefan, your example was a controller that was single shard multi workspace though. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, that was the distinction. And then Steve, the counterfactual, <clears throat> I feel like you've done a pretty good job of, of looking at some of the examples of ways that you could maybe theoretically hide it from a client. But I think, do you have enough info now that you could probably write, uh, given, you know, there's a, a world in which you to do a multi cluster aware client, you have to change the client and you have to, your controller has to select which context it's talking to. And there's a counter, which is like, we talked about options that you could use to pretend, do we have enough info to rule out that counter, the option two of you can magically make it aware. And could we like put that in some doc or do you already have that in a doc? Like to do a multi-cluster. Um, I, I, tr I tried to, I, I don't think, 
yeah, there's if you just have one client, like there's just no way. If you have a client that's capable of talking to multiple logical clusters and you get an event on your queue that says, you know, something happened, there's just no way to encode the information from that event into a delete call, for instance, without like something explicit. It, it would be good to record that maybe somewhere in like either uh, trade offs or like alternatives or like somewhere something that says like we made a choice for controllers that there is this minimal set of change that is accomplished, which is the selection yeah. of the target. We looked at the alternatives, no alternative provided magic. Here's what we considered. And then, you know, we could leave that to uh, maybe someone comes back later on and is like, ah, I thought of this completely different approach, um, but we've effectively eliminated it. Yeah. And to be clear, like the magic does exist if you know a priori that you're only ever going to talk to one logical cluster, because then you can just encode that. Um, but if you need to be able to change it, then Lose it. Yeah, so I, I put that at the bottom of one of the docs. I'll I'll show you a link. Okay, so Jason stepped away. So then the next question would be uh, from that. Then uh, do we are there any other implications of that client stuff, or do you want to move on to the next part of it? The only uh, there was one, Andy. I don't know how much you ended up looking into this today, but. Is it reasonable to opt into a different uh, key function in a multi multi cluster queue without having to change everything? I don't think so. I think the okay. informer constructor currently hard codes meta. Okay. But at least like so this like I, I don't know if Andy you and I talked about this I feel like we had like one conversation on this and somebody else and I chatted about it. I was like I don't actually know that meta can't, couldn't also break down on cluster as well it is part of meta. it's part of yeah. meta it's technically correct I could buy some argue I could buy an argument that like it's changing something that could be confusing and like we've made an argument maybe cluster name like we're never going to take it out of meta because of the v1 guarantees we've made it guaranteed it in cube but i think we would need to establish that someone else could use cluster name before you can make the argument that we could change the cache function by default but adding a new informer that takes the key key function is totally reasonable like that's just an accident of code like new informer is yeah no one's well, thought about and that. anything like the the prototype code right now modified the meta namespace key funk to encode the cluster name but it didn't modify the splitter funk to do the reverse for the decoding so we encode cluster namespace and name and we decode what's supposed to be namespace and name but like we need to make that breaking change in the go api to is that reasonable? I mean, I, I I don't see why that isn't reasonable, but because it's just basically like we originally put the key functions in there because we imagined other type of key functions. Like this is like Tim and like, you know, I think even Andy, you and I may have had some discussions really on, early on about like various aspects of this, but like, I don't know of a reason why we wouldn't expect the cache key function to be symmetric in a way. Like, if you have one half of it doing it the other right, way. Right, yeah, I know, I think it should be. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's also a to do in the code that says, let's not have this be a string. Let's use struct as a key so that we don't have to um, create a new string. With limitation. Yeah, arguably too. Um, and there's some there's some subtle performance trade offs in that key accessor, right? Like that is cache access is a critical path function for some controller types in the core code base. So I could imagine like we'd want to be careful about that. But like, as long as you could show that it's like negligible, except in like super highly synthetic, I can't think of a reason that the struct would be better than, because like creating a composite key, a, like taking two strings and glomming them together is an allocation and allocations are more expensive than indirections generally. Like allocating a new heap string to get the, you know, concatting two strings together is more expensive than creating a struct and then doing the indirection into the struct member to get the struct because most you know most of the time um you're already in the your strings are already going to be in the l1 cache um 
I was wondering why they did that originally. I assumed it was either performance or immutability. It was, it was. Uh, the thing is, though, if you pass a struct into a key, it's still immutable as well. You can't get, you can't pass in a. Um, mm -hmm. If you passed in like the struct with two members, st string string keys are special, so like hashing is going to be a little bit faster. There's some other trade offs. Um, I do not remember any concrete reason that we did anything there. Just like, like at the time, honestly, a lot of people were still learning Go. And so, um, you know, if, if you can't show in a performance test that the struct is worse, the struct is probably more correct. We use it in other places. We actually, we use it in the kubelet in a, quite a few number of places. Um, now mm -hmm. touching all caches in all controllers, uh, you know, we'd want to be able to do like a performance regression, get watch tech to look at it. But I, I don't know of a real performance reason why it would break us. Yeah, and that, that seems like a reasonable change to start proposing now, right? Like that is groundwork for, that is groundwork we can, if we think it's already more correct and equally or better for performance, we should be making that change now so, so that when we need it, it's already there. So, um, in general, like it's easy to write informers against arbitrary third party resources. Like um, not a lot of people do it, but if you wanted to stitch together like a bunch of controllers, it's probably easier to use the cache list reflector. All you need is a list call that has um, forward the forward progress sequential consistency guarantee. Like if you call, if you have a API call that hits Bugzilla and you do lists, you don't need watch to use an informer. And so um, you can actually build out that sort of infrastructure pretty easily. That is an arg like those kinds of objects are arguments for informer taking metacache and metacache being symmetric. And then if metacache is symmetric, we might as well you know, go in there. That, that's probably, or the, the cache key being symmetric is probably an argument um, and a new constructor for informers. I actually probably have a PR open somewhere from like four years ago that added that informer and then I just never merged it. Um, so it does seem reasonable to at least take a poke at it if we can come up with a justification. Does anybody want to go take a tilt at that window? Um, I mean, we so the blast radius on this is really yeah. big because it changes the constructor to creating a store because the store takes a key funk and a key funk is defined as returning a string and an error. So like this is a major, major change. No, I mean, you could just implement the old behavior with an existing constructor. Okay, so create a, a newly named constructor. Yeah, new new symmetric or new store with decoder. Maybe we do an interface. Like the, the choice of passing funks around to like, this is so like first year of cube, like YOLO. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, and we were, we were, we were trying to consolidate patterns, passing a funk there. I, I think if we had actually caught it, we wouldn't have passed a funk that it wasn't symmetric, but it was just, you know, when we reviewed it at the time, like, so I, I other than like, yeah, the blast radius, Andy, I, I'm concerned about the performance blast radius. I would definitely say, unless there is a, I would not change the signature of core cube client methods. Yeah, we have, in fact, in other reviews of some changes, like people were trying to improve, like um, the undelta queues or um, the work queue. We basically just said just create a new constructor. So are we like on in that vein? Do we want a set of client changes that are going to be fully opt in? I'm assuming if, yes. For like, Which, for uh, multi multi cluster controllers, like we're expecting them to hold a different set of abstractions than they do now, like a different set of clients that are at a higher level, I, that can be then like filtered down to cluster specific. Do we have like a working basic minimal multi cluster example that could like be used as the sounding board for that? Because I'd say, if if there's no like like we want the magic to be easy, the requirement I don't think is that a controller just magically works in a multi-cluster context. It's it's easy to adapt the existing cube plat controller pattern from the low level through controller runtime through operator SDK, but it, easy is not the same as um, automatic and magic. It's just low friction. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess if we wanted like 
like zero blast radius impact, like we'd be looking at a new layer on top of the current client set that would allow you to drill down when you need to. Yeah, so I think if you wanted to multi-tenant, like multi-workspace um, informers and controllers, you'll need some sort of opt-in or new client. I would say that existing client Go code, existing informers and listers and caches should all continue to operate against a single API space, like a, a single tenant. Yeah. Things like and things like WorkQ. Um, WorkQ is much more is much better at taking a key index, right? It explicitly calls that out. Um, you know, we're not we're not near the point in cube where we go templatize, but I would probably say, let's get all the reasons why, like you want good interfaces and you want good abstractions. Um, cache store is not specific to cube. It just happens to default to a cube thing. Informer defaults to cube things. Informers, like uh, one of the reasons we did Delta st or uh, Undelta store, I don't know, Delta, I, I can never remember which one it is. One of the reasons to do that was to allow you to build a controller that keeps two in sync. Um, that keeps something that's not cube-like with something that's cube-like in sync. Now, in practice, um, the controllers tend to not use the undelta store. They build an informer and then they do expensive things. But like, there are probably controller patterns out there that are poorly served by the existing cube, client go cube that would fit some of these changes we're trying to make. And we should spend a little bit of time looking for them. Like, I don't know if service load balancers, when they make calls to, I don't know what the current state of the art is in the cloud controllers to con contrast what's in the AWS, Google, whatever APIs in the core thing, other than just taking two lists and iterating over them periodically. But that would be a good thing to explore. Like go find the existing things that are synchronizing a cube API with another API and just make a double check that they, like the way that they're creating a store, are they using a store for the other side? Um, or is it, you know, brute force? Is there anything there that is, uh, layered above the client go that actually should just be in client go. Right. And again, these are all proposals we are making for multi-cluster aware controllers. Non-multi-cluster aware controllers should not need anything at all, or we failed. Uh, I, I actually, yeah, yeah I, I do not know. I do know that there are certain cloud controllers that are going from like a single cluster context to multiple other contexts. Like, I don't know if the VMware one actually ended up supporting multiple accounts, but like there were, like there are aspects of cloud controllers that touch on the problem of multiplicity and touch informers and cache stores. But you're right, Jason, it is primarily about what are the additional things that would use to, and maybe there's a flip side of this, which is like, we're talking about sharding by cluster name. Is there another spot where you would actually want to index by, is anybody indexing by like namespace name, another field, like the scheduler probably is in a couple of places, um, using the indexer infrastructure, any place where you would want to use an indexer or have a different key or have some uniqueness guarantees. Um, store was definitely not intended to just be, you know, namespace cube objects. It just happens to have atrophied that way. It happens to have been widely used that way. Atrophied sounds bad. Uh, wide usage is good. Um, okay. Um, right, so the other, the other issue that's come up over the last uh, week or so uh, is around auth and currently I think we can, we can get by with the current auth solution, which is that you auth once with KCP and KCP syncs. This is for multi-cluster scheduling of stuff, uh, not just the minimal API server, KCP. Um, I'm trying to be better about using the right term for these things. Um, the syncer basically has complete control over the physical clusters. And so the when you talk to KCP and say, I'd like to create a deployment, it says, okay, who are you and what are you allowed to do? And then applies it. And then the syncer syncs it with its superpowers. Um, this works fine, but is kind of bad if you don't want to have complete control over that physical cluster, or if you want to limit what the syncer is allowed to do. Um, I talked to some folks that wanted to use key cloak to, uh, a, a single centralized key cloak for both the KCP layer and the physical cluster layer to talk to 
to agree about what uh, users are allowed to do so that the users um, auth would get passed from uh, incoming in KCP and then impersonated down in uh, the sinker so that uh, only what the user is allowed to do on that physical cluster is what they are allowed to do in KCP and down on the physical cluster. Um, but I think if we're going to make this more generic and swappable, we probably need to swap out also key cloak for something else. If something somebody else has something else, uh, I wanted to bring that here in case people had thoughts on th if they've already had thoughts in this area or already had uh, uh, answers to this problem. Um, I don't think we've talked much about off so far. Um, so which which doc are we going to record this in your transparent multi-cluster design uh, control the synchro design at this point yeah sure okay I so mean, then i'll i'll lay out a requirement um the sinker is not allowed to be root and ideally that there are certain things that the sinker cannot do on the underlying cluster that allows us to have a security boundary of defense in depth where certain operations can be reasoned about as unless the sinker is changed from its default config or forked or whatever, certain transformations cannot happen. So can you give me an example of something that we should, oh, well, two part question, something we should enforce that the sinker cannot do and how we will enforce that? So changing cluster level settings is a good example of a good boundary, which is adding and removing CRDs adding cluster scoped resources, removing cluster scoped resources, modifying cluster scoped resources. That is, at least at a first approximation, based on what we have said, what transparent multi-cluster is intended to accomplish, unless we have a counter example, no cluster scoped resource can be modified by default. That would be a sinker that is intended to only do namespace aware things. And then the question is, is right. it allowed to create, update, or modify namespaces? And that is the security question of which namespaces is allowed to create and how is that enforced? That would be the only cluster scoped resource that I can imagine exists. And then given that, what are the things that we would, what are the things that would be nice to have in the use case that we've talked about so far for transparent multi-cluster that give no more privileges Give Synchro no more privileges than are required to accomplish its mission, which is to create and update status or those resources in the inside of work a namespace. Yeah, that is so, under its control. So if uh, if the Synchro has permission to create and do everything to namespaces, it also has to have RBAC permissions to those namespaces to give itself permission to do stuff in the namespace it just created. And in order to do that, it has to have. Uh, Cluster-wide RBAC permissions. It, it, it can't give itself permission well, only to namespaces it created. Well, it cannot, but there are existing systems that can do that. Um, so there's also do you mean such as Keycloak, or, or is that like no, like projects okay. in OpenShift already? Yeah, like that. That that's one way that we could do it. Another way is um, there is a there is a rule that potentially allows it to create namespaces with a prefix. Mm. And any prefix given to that sinker, it can create underneath. And the choice of the prefix provides that that isolation guarantee. That's one. Um, but then, so it, so, can, so it would create a namespace and then say, and I am allowed to do anything I want in this namespace. And in order to make that call, the I, and I am allowed to do anything I want in here, it has to have cluster-wide RBAC edit permission. Uh, something there there has to be a grant of permission on a prefix or on the, the things in that prefix or a controller that runs on that cluster outside of the sinkers that says when the, you know when this namespace is created you know the sinker is allowed to use it because of the prefix like so that system yeah, yeah, yeah. i think is an under designed thing but like does anybody disagree that the security boundaries that that would provide would potentially be valuable in and of itself like we're not trying to recreate clusterlet in this, the advantage is if you have those guarantees in place, then um, you can leverage controls against the sinker like a regular user versus just assuming that it's root on all the clusters. Uh, and that's another, yeah. So I think that that provides useful security boundaries 
beyond what we have now, which is the Wild West and clusters or uh, uh, sinkers are basically God mode on the cluster. Um, I wonder, and th so that is also a, a level between full God mode and key cloak where everything talks to the same uh, auth server to decide whether the sinker is allowed to apply this deployment that it was asked to, to apply or whatever. Right, it's, it, so it still has, it, it lives in a bubble that it created uh, and has, and some other system created that bubble for it. it today, and, and like the, the closest analog to this is, um, what if a node, like a VM on a node that runs a kubelet is not root on the bare metal machine that the VM is inside of? Mm -hmm. um, is there any analog, like every every layer and anytime anybody's done anything multi-cluster in cube, they start with the security assumption that they're just root on everything. I think that a fundamental property that we are trying to get to would be that you feel like it is a low risk operation to give out chunks of cluster capacity to workload and that the sinker is con constrained by a set of reasonable constraints that everybody would pick by default. And then it would be abnormal or optional to exceed those. That would affect, and again, because these workloads are supposed to be cluster agnostic. If they're not cluster agnostic and you need those additional privileges and you're trying to do that, that is a different set of problems than, it is totally valuable. Or it's totally valid that there might be a sinker somewhere that is root on the cluster, right? You can imagine the clusterlet and sinker and other types of things like uh, Argo agents converging on a, yep, I want to do an admin level things, but that is not the same problem as trying to uh, <coughs> schedule workloads onto clusters. Hmm. <laughs> uh, Andy has his hand up. Thanks. Um, yeah, just to restate what I think I was hearing. Um, so you'd <laughs> have, you'd give a sinker a permission to a subset of namespaces on a cluster, especially not cube system and things like that. And that is the level of grant that you give it. And you don't have to worry about a, another authorization check. Uh, so like you, you do the, the check at the KCP layer, you're authorized to create a deployment. And as long as that's synced down to a namespace that is in a, a subset that the thinker has access to, it's good to go. Is that what you were saying, Clayton? Yeah, there's a failure domain aspect here that the key quote, like when you say, I will delegate all authorization decisions, not, not authentication, authorization decisions to a third party system, you are now no more reliable than that third party system. Mm -hmm. So there is a, I think part of our quote unquote mandate slash goal is to make failure domains practical and understandable and offer a recommendation for how you design multi-cluster to clearly, safely, and meaningfully tolerate certain failure zones. Where possible delegating responsibilities such that the cluster can perform in isolation the decisions has advantages, whereas coupling to a third-party system means you're basically as reliable as the the auth z system um, and yes. so the, that's a trade-off that we could choose in either direction but we need to ask ourselves is that trade-off the wor worthwhile does this mean the sinker knows about the resource types and their auth requirements like what a service account needs as permissions um when you say that you mean things like uh, security context constraints or pod security? Yeah, also just uh, all bindings for certain APIs synced oh. from the parent cluster down to the. So this is definitely called out somewhere, and this is a JSON thing. So in some design somewhere, we explicitly describe we we should, and if it doesn't, it should be in the transparent multi cluster document that the assumption that the service account. That when you get privileges on a service account at the high level, that is mapped, that does not guarantee you service account privileges in the physical cluster. In fact, it explicitly does not do that by design as part of it. It's probably in the stepping doc, but Jason, we should just yeah. call it out and say, by design, a service account at the higher level is a service account at the higher level that is not implicit, like that is not mapped to the service account in a way that gives you access to the physical cluster by default implications, trade-offs, et cetera. 
Yeah, I think we'd actually even talked about if if your workload says it needs a service account, this indicates you care about the API server you're talking to. And so you should be talking to the KCP API Correct. server and not it, your physical cluster API server. So that's where we inject in the the repointing that that uh, that pod to talk back up to KCP. It, yeah, it, let, let's break the use case of today when you get a service account yeah. and you grant a service account secret in a pod on a cluster, there are two use cases, which are I'm choosing to get access to this cluster for the purposes of, um, of access. And there's another one, which is I'm choosing to talk to the source of truth for my for the controller or application that I'm trying to run to. Those are we cannot tell those apart today in the KCP world. That is very distinct. The case of I'm trying to talk to the physical cluster I'm on to program it or to understand it is a different use case than the I'm running a controller talking to APIs. Today, all cube controllers roughly assume that the control plane they're talking to is the one that's providing, is hosting them. We are going to take advantage of that, but we are breaking that assumption. And if you want to say, schedule a controller that talks to physical clusters, in the short run, the answer is use something else like ACM or Argo or sync sets or GitOps or magic. In the future, we might bring back a use case, which is I would like the, to run a controller that orchestrates a physical cluster mm -hmm. that will be through something that is not the default transparent multi cluster experience. Right. But I'm not talking only about um, controlling the physical cluster, but I'm talking about other resources which the workload needs provided by the parent cluster. And they must be synced as well downstream, and I need permissions to access them. If you need to permissions to again. access those resources, you are getting access to those at the KCP level, not the downstream. But when you're talking about other resources, like you're talking about um, service accounts, a bad one because that one overlaps, but like uh, config maps, config maps. Uh, the cluster that is exposed to you, if the syncer does not have access to config maps, then the syncer does not support config maps. I, we would probably define a set of resources. Like the end goal here is to deliver homogenous chunks of API workload capacity that is stable over long periods from physical clusters and all workload specific APIs and fast moving things move at the higher level. So that is a two level system where all workload extension happens at the higher level and all infrastructure extension happens at the lower level. To get to the point though, Stefan is like, I think we're talking about, we would define one or two sets of API resources at the physical cluster level that are explicit. We have a default behavior for, everything else is opt-in. And opt-in may mean you have to ask the cluster administrator to start syncing that resource type. It is not an end okay, user. So that's, that's what I meant. That's really manual and you have to know what you're doing there. It, we, we should clarify this in the transparent multi-cluster docs a little bit more. I think we've had a few discussions, but they may not have made it into that. Like the world is divided into application workload level and infrastructure level. A PVC is infrastructure. Why? Because we said so. A config map, a secret, those are generic application infrastructure. An etcd instance is by default a workload concept. If you wanted to expose etcd instance to all of your cluster users, you could add it to the default set, but an administrator of the physical cluster would make the choice to install it on that cluster, guarantee its life cycle, give RBAC access to the syncer, and then the syncer would announce that and begin syncing it, but only at that point would the syncer bring it in. And we, we should have that duality represented probably in transparent multi-cluster, because I think it's at the heart of defining what transparent multi-cluster means. And if that uh, uh, if that resource, if that controller, that infrastructure controller, uh, if the cluster it is running on uh, has a problem or disappears or whatever, and it will get scheduled to something else, that other cluster must also have opted into the things it needs to work, right? And there is a and and I do not know that we've said it in this group, but it's like really really important as part of this. If the simple things are what gets synced down, and the simple things are resilient. That does mean that if you want to depend, like if you need a construct that's not satisfied by config map secrets, uh, DNS, services, service, et cetera, like those slow APIs that are stable and predictable everywhere, you probably should write your workload or your lower level thing to deal with those interfaces versus inventing new CRDs that you then orchestrate to. 
that is a conceptual difference. So like mm -hmm. staple sets, the etcd team, um, the hypershift guys are like, hey, maybe the etcd operator is actually a bad architectural. They picked up some learnings from how others were doing it. And they're like, hey, maybe the staple set should just depend on basic cube and all changes should be injected via a higher level operation that could be done by those things checking into like, you know, somebody drives a config map and then that says what truth is, but you have a nice clean separation between high level and then what's delegated that's like very mechanic run a sidecar. So that's kind of breaking that whole run a bunch of operators that are like super deeply coupled to everything into think about whether you're providing a basic capability or you're doing like the really complex stuff up here. And that means those cust clusters should coast, um, but that may complicate people who want to do complex recovery of workloads, right? Like if, you, if your Vitesse operator needs to go do stuff, maybe that's something that you install at an infrastructure level and you accept the fact that you have mm -hmm. to install it everywhere. We're giving you a choice. Um, not all of those choices are going to be straightforward. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, we're at time. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week, one hour earlier. Steve, we decided to start next week, one hour earlier, just for maximum confusion with time zones. Uh, all right. See you, everyone. Thanks.